Okay, sorry about that. I, um, I had to reset my uh, password over Easter, and I can't remember what it is, so it took me ages to log in. Sorry about that. Um, Connor, when you're ready. No? Well, we'll finish your conversations, haven't you? Um, how are you all? One thumbs up. Two thumbs up from one person, to be fair, so I don't know if that counts as two. Um, it's the last lecture of this module. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, tomorrow, when there's supposed to be seminars, I will be in my office. Okay, so if you have any questions, you want any help, come and see me then. Next week, when there's a lecture at 2 p.m. on the Monday, I will be in my office. You can come and see me then. Uh, and the same goes for the, the, the seminars, which would be on the Tuesday next week as well. And probably the week after as well. I've got nothing else to do, so I might as well be hanging about, helping if you need to. So that goes for assignment two, which is due on the 9th of May. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Um, with regards to reading anything that you want to be checked, I will read anything from a sentence to the full 2,000 words, as far as I'm concerned. I know different people have different rules for proofing and, well, let me clarify this. I don't proofread your work. I will tell you there's mistakes and you can go and fix them yourselves because you're adults. But um, with regards to the quality of what it is, and I will make suggestions, etc. And I, Most people always ask, am I on the right lines? Yeah, which is fine. So as soon as you have stuff, if you want it read and checked, and I won't give you like an exact, oh yeah, this is going to get this grade, but I'll give you an indication of one, where I think it's at, and two, how I think you can bolster your grade from that position if you need to go higher. That's fair, isn't it? So you've got two options. You can either come and see me in any of those times or um, feel free to email me something across. Okay, do we have any questions? You've, has everyone had their grade for assignment one, first of all? Has everyone accessed their feedback for assignment one? Do we have any questions about that feedback? No? How do you find this voice feedback malarkey? Saves me hours. It really, it's, it's amazing. It's really good. Um, did you all know that aside from the voice feedback, you have a set of criterion grades as well? Do they display that to you? They do. All right. Okay. Because you don't see it from the other side, so I was kind of wondering why. All right. So today's lecture is very, very simple, and that is the title of it. You need to delete your social media accounts today. So your task for today to complete this part of the module and indeed complete the module in its entirety is at the end of this lecture you will delete all your social media accounts okay because you can see that's not a question that's a command so you need to delete your social media accounts today on the basis of what we have covered in this module so far my recommendation is and having marked all your assignments and looked through them all and assessed how you feel about your social media use, my only recommendation could be that you all need to delete your social media accounts right now. Because the overwhelming majority of you stress that social media makes you feel unhappy, gives you negative body issues, gives you negative mood, affects your friendliness affects your ability to socialize with other people affects your way your ability to do any work affects your attention span it's bad for you it's quite clearly you know i'm a doctor right but i'm not the kind of doctor that writes prescriptions unfortunately because if i was that would solve a lot of problems in my life as well because i could just write myself prescriptions but never mind but I am nevertheless a doctor, so I can make a diagnosis here. You're all sick. Okay? Now, you're all social media, some of you, from the basis of your assignments, are sick in different ways as well, and you probably need help that I can't offer you. But some of you are sick because you use social media. That much is true. You have outlined that you feel unwell. 
that you would like to be something else, that you would like to feel another way, but you feel unable to do that because, I know you're addicted. Addiction's an illness. You know that? You know, like if somebody's an alcoholic, you don't say like, you know, well, you used to years ago, but you don't anymore say, that's your problem, fix it. It's recognised that that's an illness. How many of you in this room said you were addicted to social media? You know, an addiction's not a good thing to have, he says, puffing on one of these all the time. But, um, you know, don't be like me, for fuck's sake. All right? So, my only, you know, advice to help you all get better is this. You need to delete your social media accounts right now. Now, who is going to tell me why they're not going to do that? Because while I'm giving you really good sound medical advice here, none of you are going to do it, so tell me why not. Is it? <laughs> why is it important? Henry Jenkins, that fucking hack. <laughs> Global communication. You're spouting a lot of phrases, but it's like listening to a Rishi Sunak press conference This at this point, all right? There's a lot of things being said and nothing actually makes any sense. But I try and elaborate on this, okay? I'll give you a second. Anyone else? Why aren't you going to do it? Mm? Because... Well, if you were addicted to heroin, would you stop? I mean, the, the, it's an interesting point, all right? The idea, oh, I'm addicted to it, so I'm not going to stop. If, let's take that to the nth degree here. How many of you have ever tried smoking cigarettes? It's okay, we're in an open forum, you're not being recorded, nobody can see. If you've tried smoking cigarettes, please put your hand up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, we've got quite a lot. How many of you still smoke cigarettes? Good on you. Good on you. I like it. It's a dying habit and we're a dying breed. All right? I don't... I like occasionally, every now and again. Um, but the rest of you stopped. Yeah? Why'd you do that? Smoking cigarettes, okay, is great. It makes you feel good, and you look cool as. So why did you stop smoking cigarettes? It's more of a social thing. A social thing? Yeah. Oh, like what, mate? Like what social thing was it? You, know, you can't really go to the smokers area and not have one. <laughs> oh, so you picked it up because you wanted to fit in with people? Well, It is, it is what you do, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, but why did you stop then? I hate you. I hate <laughs> you and all that you stand for at this point. I hate people who can just give it up like that. It's impossible. Anyone else? Why did they stop smoking? Because you don't. <gasps> now we get in somewhere. Because you don't want to die. Okay, because I don't know. Um, has anyone got, have we got a pack on you? No, you got a pack. Have we got tobacco or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Have we got tobacco or anything like that on you? A pack of cigarettes? Okay. Not currently. I've got some in my office, but they they. That's <laughs> bad. <laughs> but I don't smoke, but I got like eight packs in my office. But they don't have a warning on them because they're not strictly speaking supposed to be sold in this country. Um, You've all, you all know what I mean when I say you've seen a packet of cigarettes, right? And you've seen them these days where they have like a gnarly picture of somebody's lung or something or some guy who's got no teeth or some shit like that, right? Or some fetus that's been born deformed or something like that, right? Or a liver or some shit, right? They got all this nasty stuff on them. And it says quite clearly on the packet, smoking kills. Okay? And all the scientific evidence tells us that smoking kills. And it also says a few other things. It says, like, smoking is highly addictive. Don't start. Right? So, it's always, so it's always telling you up front 
okay? This stuff will kill you, and you shouldn't start in the first place. But if you do smart, ring one of these numbers, and you'll get help for quitting, right? That's how smoking kind of works. And if you're anything like me, you live in complete denial for decades about this until one day you start coughing up blood, and then you think, oh, shit, I better do something about this because that's probably not what should be happening when you're 40 years old. Anyway, you might think, what the hell am I going on about here? Smoking is an addictive thing that causes people harm, and it's very clearly labelled as such. Therefore, the vast majority of people who start smoking stop because they don't want the negative consequences, which are quite clearly laid out to us. You're going to die if you carry on doing this, right? Everything is clear. Yeah? So, we have social media. And I am giving you the public health warning, which you have provided. I'm not making this up. I have sat through 60 assignments where you're all going on about how horrible this thing is and how it makes you feel like shit and how it makes you inattentive, unable to do work, unable to do anything, compare yourself unrealistically to people even though you know it's fake, you still do it. Make you feel like the bottom rung of everything around you causes immense psychological harm makes you into a narcissist, which is what many people said, makes you nihilistic, which is what a lot of, a lot of other people said. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking this from the lecture slides. I'm taking it from what you guys have said. And I'm giving you the public health warning that says this is going to really kill you psychologically if you carry on doing it. And yet nobody is going to take my advice, right? <laughs> See, if this was a drug, they'd ban it. It's that simple. If you look at the overwhelming evidence of psychological damage and ill health that this medium causes, it get banned. Now, you might want to reflect on why it's not, but I'm giving you the free opportunity here. Make yourself feel better by getting rid of all of this. But we have had an interjection here from Toby, right? And it is a valuable one. He's not going to delete his social media accounts because of some nonsense about it being a global communications network and relying on Henry Jenkins, somebody whose ideas are so discounted now that we wouldn't even think about it. But let's have another go. Why then, my friend, will you not delete it? Okay, well, yeah, well, let's flesh that out then. Uh -huh. Maybe not Henry Jenkins, but like Anthony <laughs> Giddens, maybe. And what does Anthony Giddens say? Isn't he the global village? No, that would be Marshall McLuhan. Um, but, okay. Does Marshall McLuhan say the global village is a good thing? Ah, uh, yeah, you go, see. Um, yeah, it's ambiguous. Anyway, let's try and structure it. Go on. Um, Ha ha, now we get somewhere. What do you mean by that? Unpack that idea for me. Why is this social norm? Okay, M. That don't make sense. <laughs> It's, I gotta go back to my smoking argument, yeah. But millions of people do. Millions of people recognise the harm that things are doing to them. Well, that's true. We relapse, yeah, I suppose. But people do get clean, right? You know. So I like this. I like this idea of the social norm. That it's become normative behaviour to have social media, and to use it, and to not have it places you outside of a norm of society. You're a freak, right? If you don't have social media, basically. Now, we can carefully analyse those two claims. Let's go for the first one. That social media has become a norm of society. 
And in order to be a normal part of everyday society, one must have social media accounts. Well, guess what, folks? That was exactly the argument that the tobacco companies were making up until the 1970s, when smoking was virtually ubiquitous. They knew it gave people cancer and that it gave can people cancer very early. But they still encouraged it because if you didn't smoke, you were a nobody. You, you didn't fit in with the rest of society because everyone smoked. That's why everyone died of cancer. That's why one of the reasons in the Western world that average age of life expectancy has gone up radically since the 1950s and 60s because smoking has become less prevalent. People don't all of a sudden keel over of heart attacks and lung cancer in the 50s and 60s. They now do it in the 70s and 80s, but that kind of happens anyway. Because we've only got a finite time on the earth. So that first argument, although I accept that it is absolutely correct the way you've stressed it, and that is how people feel, it is still flawed. Just because something is considered a norm for people to do doesn't mean it's not dangerous, right? Doesn't mean it doesn't have detrimental effects. Yeah? It used to, when I was a kid, you didn't have to wear a seatbelt in a car. That's how old I am. But that only came in in like the eight, in like late 80s. Can you imagine driving about with no seatbelt on? Like people used to fly through windscreens. Not like just generally, but if they hit something, people would just fly through the windscreen, right? And then they thought it was a good idea to have a seatbelt. I remember, the f I remember being in the car when I was a kid with my dad, who drove like a maniac, and there weren't any seatbelts in the car. The car didn't have them fitted. I was like, this is normal, right? So it, just because something is accepted as a norm does not mean that it's a good thing. We're going through exactly this kind of thing at the moment in Wales with the 20 mile an hour speed limit. You know, and everyone's saying, oh, they should get rid of it. It's terrible. It's ruining the place and stuff like that. Well, the first time you put it back and the kid gets killed when they're hit at 30 miles an hour until, instead of 20 miles an hour, don't come crying to me. All right? It's because it's not. doesn't mean it's a good thing. The second aspect of this, I'll come to you in a second then, but the second aspect of this, and I'm sort of, I'm not picking on you, Em, on this, right? but it's like, you know, Social media is addictive, therefore we can't do it. Perhaps there is something very powerful in that, but that still doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Because there is a difference between what we want to do and what we should do. Yeah? I don't want to come to work. Okay? It's not that I don't enjoy my job, it's just I would be a lot happier sat at home playing video games all day, smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol. If I could do that for a living, landed. I would be so happy, all right? But I can't do it because, you know, I have to do other stuff. Just because it's something that we want to do does not mean we should do it. What were you going to say, Em? It's a, it, that, now, that's an interesting point. That is an interesting point because it poses a thought experiment, right? Um, I've said at various points in this module that you guys are sort of social media generation, right? You don't know a world without social media. Had social media not been a presence in your life ever, do you then think that you would be able to socialise with people without it? That's pretty much how it happens, yeah. Yeah, like, you're, you know, you message someone else, do you want to do this, and whether you can or can't, you won't do them. Is it scary to just think about going and knock on somebody's door to see if they're there? <laughs> Social anxiety on you lot. <laughs> um, seems kind of normal to me, but, but there you go. It, it's, it, it poses this interesting thought experiment to us. What if you had never experienced social media? How would you have socialised with people? I could have a fairly good guess at that. You would have socialised people who live with people who live near you. 
in your immediate vicinity, with people who you spent time with on a daily basis at school, college, university, anything you did after those things, you know? Other family members, extended family, etc. That's kind of how socialization worked prior to social media. You know, you went and you kind of knocked on someone's door and if they were in, they were in, and if they weren't in, you were fucked. You know, you have to spend time alone reading poetry and developing character and shit like that, right? So, there could be a world without social media. There could be one. We still have this social norm that says we all have to have it. But if we all did this right now, we could have something different, perhaps something healthier. You know? It's entirely possible. I've said it more than once in this module. If everyone deleted their Instagram account today, and I mean everyone on there, what would happen to Instagram? It would go bankrupt, yeah. It would instantly go bankrupt. Because it, the entirety of that platform is the people that use it. There is nothing else. That's all that exists, is the people that use Instagram. So if everyone stopped using it all at once, that's what would happen. And indeed, we've seen this happen in the past. Social media has undergone periods where entire platforms have absolutely disappeared. So the platforms I remember emerging in the early 2000s, Friendster, disappeared. Bebo completely disappeared. MySpace went totally because people just deleted their accounts. It got to a critical tipping point where it was like, right, there is no network anymore. It doesn't exist. There's no, one, there's no one using this anymore. There's no traffic. It's gone. And it disappears. So we could quite easily change the world if we wanted to. But I accept that I have not really put forward a conclusive argument for doing this yet. So I am going to use somebody else's argument today. Or somebody's ten arguments yet. So, to frame what I'm going to talk about today, let's take away some of the main points of this module. What have we talked about? We've talked about the idea of social media fostering a participatory culture, and I have repeatedly and conclusively demolished any notion that there is a participatory culture on social media, because it's not participation if all you're doing is being exploited. All things that go on on social media are unpaid labour, and there's a fascinating um, element to this, and he's here right now. Do you get monetized? Yeah. Why not? Not big enough. Not big enough. But you're bigger than... You'd be in the top, like, 5%. And you don't get paid. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. Um, somebody often says to me, oh, yeah, you know, you always talk about exploitation lately, but what about those people who get paid? You know, what about influencer culture and people who get paid for their content and stuff like that? That is like 0.001% of users on social media platforms. And no less, those people who do get paid, they don't get paid all the money that they make. The network makes more than the person. The platform always wins. So if you are in a position where you are getting monetized, I can guarantee you're getting screwed because they're taking more than you're actually earning for them by several magnitudes of order. So the social itself has been remediated, which links to a number of these points. And indeed, we can't conceive of the social without social media anymore. This does lead to new forms of expression of the self, which a lot of you looked at in your projects for assignment one with regards to how you present yourself in different ways on different platforms for example how for some of you that's a very positive thing but for some it's really not the concept of privacy itself has been entirely altered in that we now accept on a very basic level that we have no privacy and explain it away in sentences like our I don't care if they sell me adverts because I'm not going to buy anything anyway. That is the most common response to pe when, people, when I point out to people that they are being fundamentally exploited on social media. And do you know what? 
it's nothing to do with adverts. It's nothing to do with the adverts that you see. It's to do with the entire content that you see over a long period of time that pushes your attitude towards certain things. That's what it's about. If you just concentrate on one advert that you see on TikTok, you're missing the picture, which is your entire For You page is structured to have you to accept certain opinions. That's what actually happens. Any alternatives to social media are very, very difficult, and alternatives to established platforms are. Emotions are now subject to the logic of social media, and many of you explored this idea in your projects that you, know, you get highs and lows on the basis of what you experience in your flows of uh, information. We're undergoing a shift from communication to entertainment. So those who have said communication is really important here, I want to emphasize that social media is becoming less and less about communicating with people and more and more about consuming content. It can't be better exhibited than with TikTok, which is very little about communicating with other people and much more about consuming content. And kind of Instagram is always like that a bit, but it's less of a stranglehold than TikTok puts on us. And that protesting against this is possible, and protest in general is possible in contemporary life, but only within this system that we've not created, but signed up to, willingly signed up to this entire system. So this gross leviathan that's dominating our lives and making us feel like shit, the worst point of it is we all said yes. You saw the terms and conditions, didn't you? When you downloaded the app and you didn't read them. I'm sure on the Instagram terms and conditions like point 10, point 0.7, point 0.3, it says we are going to steal your soul. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in there, but, um, I, you know, but nobody ever gets far, that far down, unfortunately. Um, is there, anyone, <laughs> there is definitely somewhere on the YouTube ones they're going to turn you into human centipede at some point. It's definitely done in that one. Okay, so, obviously we've talked about other things as well, but that's a fairly good adjoinment of what we have been talking about. So, how am I going to structure my argument that you should delete this? Well, I'm, you know, in the greatest traditions of academia, I'm going to steal someone else's argument. So, Jaron Lanier, in 2018, released a book called, unsurprisingly, 10 Reasons for Deleting Your Social Media Right Now. That book is in the reading folder on um, Canvas. You can download it. Um, it's fairly easy to read through. It's an evening's read at most, two hours perhaps tops. It's a really short book and it's really, really straightforward. I'm going to distill Lanier's book into the rest of this lecture. Uh, so I'm going to go through each of the ten arguments in turn. But we can sum up Lanier's argument um, in this He's talking directly about Facebook here, but Facebook's just a placeholder because really what he's talking about here is Facebook characterizes all social media to an extent. And Facebook, according to Jaron Lanier, is a bummer. So it's Google, so it's Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and even WhatsApp. Bummer is an acronym, and it is an acronym for this. Behavior of users are modified and made into an empire for rent. So, what do we have here? B, behavior. Take everything we do on a daily basis and make it subject to change. Users, that's us. Modified, that is the change itself. So, we are being transformed to do something. Made, we are being basically taking what we are and changing us into something else. An empire, the nature of the companies themselves become empire-like with their scale and their revenues. For rent. That refers to how users themselves are simply positioned as economic units to be sold out. But it's not a sale in itself. Because... If I, may, if I was to sell you something now, right, as right, tenner, you give me the tenner, it's yours. Yeah, that's it. Sale done. All over with. Good. But we are not for sale here. We are for rent. Because we are much more like a grotty 
sort of student-let in Bryn Mill than we are a product. Because if you are what, a person who lives in a grotty student-let in Bryn Mill, you will know two things. One, damp is a real problem in Swansea. And two, hundreds of people have lived in that place before you. And that is more like the nature of what the relationship we have with social media is. We are continually being leased out over and over and over again. Hundreds of thousands of times a day because this is done at algorithmic speeds. So instead of being sold, we are simply rented. We're continually rented out. All of us. Billions of us. Every second of every day. That's kind of grim, right? Now, that's the fundamental basis of what Lania says is the problem with social media and why we should get rid of it straight away. So, let's have a look at his arguments. What do we have here? Oh, that's backwards, not forwards. Just to flesh it out a little bit further. When you use social media, you are not a customer, you are a product. I think that's something that I've been able to establish fairly conclusively over the period of, that we've been doing this module. So people are paying, basically, not to sell products to you, because that's too simple. That's the old way of doing things. That's the old media way of doing things. Instead, people are paying to manipulate your behavior on the basis of statistical probabilities that you cannot see and indeed they cannot understand. Companies are not paying to put adverts in front of you because most of us really don't respond well to that. Instead, they're paying these organizations like Meta, Google, etc. to manipulate us, to make us more pliable to the products that are being offered, to continually push us in ways that we don't understand in order to make us do things. Now, nobody needs to know why you're more likely to buy X or vote Y if you've just seen a cat video or a news item, but mathematically speaking, you are, so that's what the system will show you. If a, if a political party goes to Facebook and says, I want people not to vote for me, but not to vote for the other person, Okay, so imagine now you've got an election where there's two options. Okay, you've got person X and person Y. And person X goes to Facebook and says, what I want you to do is to stop people from voting for person Y, because that will mean that eventually more people will vote for me. I don't want you to make people a vote for me. I want you to stop them from voting for that one. Okay, so it will tip the balance so that I win. Okay. That company sets to work on this. Now, for some people, a direct approach will be good. We'll just have a load of crap about how person Y is a complete piece of shit, right? And that will put people off. But for a lot of other people, it will be about a constant stream of manipulative information, which over time will push them into a position which makes them more susceptible to not vote for person Y. It will not be direct, but... Nevertheless, it will be a constant stream of information which is designed algorithmically to make it more likely that that person will execute that behavior. You might think, Leighton, that's fucking crazy. What are you talking about? That's never happened. That is the story, my friends, of the 2016 US presidential election. I have not made that example up. That's what happened. Trump's team and team, people working on behalf of Trump went to social media companies and explicitly said, we don't want you to put adverts out encouraging people to vote for Donald Trump because it won't work. Because people hate Donald Trump. They're not going to do it anyway. But what we want you to do is to stop people from voting for Hillary Clinton. If she doesn't get enough people who would normally support her to actually support her, then we can win. And that's exactly what happened. Trump didn't win because he was more popular. In fact, he lost the popular vote anyway. But through specifically targeting individuals in swing states in the United States, there was an encouragement not to vote for Hillary Clinton. Not to go and vote for Donald Trump. There's no evidence that anything on social media helped Donald Trump get more votes. 
But what did happen was that the expected turnout for Clinton was way less in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. 15, 20% down on people who had voted for Obama in the previous election because they simply encouraged people to not go out and vote for her. So enough doubt that people decide, well, I'm not going to vote for the other one because he's crazy. But I'm not going to vote for this one as well because that's just an endorsement of whatever crap we've just, I've just seen about her. And you do that enough times and you can tip the balance. And that's exactly what happened. So this makes it very difficult, for, uh, different from traditional marketing. Which companies try and persuade you to buy X or vote Y? Because it'll make you safer, cooler, richer, sexier, whatever, right? Usually, with traditional marketing, you put together some kind of marketing mix. And you guys know more about this than me, by the way, because you've done modules on it in uni. I don't care, all right? But you usually, you, you have a nice image and a nice strap, you know, all this shit, right? And the marketing mix and, you know, all this crap, right? And then you go and sell it. This is not how it works here. Instead, you're, you're trying to change people's behavior entirely to do different things. So Facebook and Google work by manipulating your emotions, emotion, information networks, friendship, communication, awareness of news, and social behavior in order to make it statistically more likely that you will do a particular action, like buy something. This is kind of, um, this is the point of this module where I like, <laughs> I have to um, be honest that, we're teaching students entirely the wrong thing in this university. That, you know, how many of you do PR as a t subject? And you've done PR modules. Yeah, most of you, I would think, in this room. Um, we should not be teaching you that stuff. We should be teaching you this stuff. How to manipulate people algorithmically. Because that's actually how the world works now. The old-fashioned stuff is just window dressing. This is how things get done. Um, of course, that would upset a lot of my colleagues whose job it is to teach you that stuff, but then I don't see them sitting in here, so fuck them. All right. um, and at the end of the day, this is actually what people who work in PR and marketing need to understand, that it's not about the product anymore. Yeah, sure, the traditional way will get you so far, but actually what you need to do is manipulate people on a much different level, and that actually gets results in a way that nobody could have dreamed of, you know? Uh, in the past. Edward Bernays would absolutely shit himself if he saw what we can do today with emotional manipulation on this kind of system. So, these are all reasons why we should get rid of social media. Right? You are being manipulated. Your very concept of free will is being taken off you by the things that you use every day, but by your own admittance, you don't like anyway. Because it makes you feel shit. So you already admitted that you don't like it, and, you know, <laughs> it's taking your free will away from you. All right. That leads me on to point one. You are losing your free will. Who can tell me what free will is? I'm looking at the philosophers in the room in particular. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a fairly good understanding, I think. I, th I think what, what I would call that, in really swanky philosophical terms, that's what we call the lay epistemology of free will. Um, is, that means it's the everyday understanding and the everyday knowledge of what free will is. And I think... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's exactly what people would understand free will as. The ability for me to make my own decisions and not be under the control of anyone else who makes the decisions for me. Does that sound fair? That's what we understand free will to be, right? So, why then is social media making you lose your free will? Because, according to Lanier, social media is Pavlovian. Does anyone know what the hell he's talking about? It's nothing to do with like a Russian dessert. Although it is to do with a Russian guy. Does anyone know what Pavlovian refers to? Conditioning. Very good. Conditioning. What kind of conditioning? 
or do you know anything about Pavlov? No, I'm not you did. I just need that stuff. Okay, that's good, Will. Positive reinforcement, nice. We're getting towards a nice little thing here. Excellent. Anyone else got anything? Uh, anyone know? Who? Classical conditioning, lovely. So the overall uh, idea from Pavlovian experiments was classical conditioning. So it fills in Will's point, which involves positive and negative reinforcement in order to make somebody undertake a particular kind of behavior. Do you know anything about Pavlov's experiments? Excellent. Couldn't put it any better myself. So, in the late part of the 19th century, um, Pavlov, who, uh, Ivan Pavlov, who was a Russian physiologist, um, had a laboratory in which he had some dogs, which he did experiments on. And um, what he noted was, and this is like many scientific discoveries, completely by accident, he noted that the dogs would, started, would start to salivate at particular times of the day. And why would they do that? Well, the feeding times were set. For the dogs. So a couple of minutes before the feeding time, the dogs would start to salivate because they were expecting food because it was a regular system that they had going there. And so he was like, oh, okay, those dogs have learned where the food was coming from. I wonder if I can make them learn something else. So what he did was he paired the initial stimulus, which is food, and the response. So conditioning is all about stimulus and response. So you've got a stimulus, food, response, salivation. And he paired the initial stimulus, the food, with another stimulus, the ringing of a bell. So every time they were fed or the food was being prepared, a bell would ring. And he did this over a number of trials, which is how classical conditioning works. And then, after a while, he removed the initial stimulus, the food, and just had the bell. And when that happened, he rung the bell and all the dogs started salivating <laughs> because they had come to associate the bell with the food and the response stayed the same. And this is a classic, this was the initial thing of what we call classical conditioning. You can get people to do things by pairing a particular response together. So, for example, you can get people to give up smoking by having a negative response. One of the ways they used to do it years ago is they'd encourage people to um, have an elastic band around their wrist. And every time you thought about having a cigarette, ping. Has anyone ever done that on the wrist? Pinged an elastic band? Who hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it's, I mean, he says... <laughs> It's quite tender, they covered in tattoos, but you know. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's quite a sensitive part of the body, right? So if you think of something bad, ping, and eventually you'll stop thinking of the bad thing because you'll come to associate it with the pain that you have. Now, we do this with animals all the time, right? Some people use shock collars with dogs, for example, and then when the dog does something naughty, and then they stop doing the naughty thing, yeah? We do it with kids all the time. This is one of the major ways of parenting. You know, when you're a small kid, you know, they don't, they, fortunately they don't do this version anymore, at least not in Wales where it's illegal. But like when I was a kid, and I was terrible as a kid, right, because I'm not, I'm not all there, am I? You know, um, I, I, I used to think it would be an interesting experiment when I was like two or three to drink bleach. For example, I, 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 wanna, I would have thought that's a great idea. Like, I see this stuff going in things, and it cleans everything. So if I did that, my insides would be clean. I'd better drink some, right? And my mother would stop me from doing this by screeching at me at such a high volume and pitch that I would go deaf in a year, right? Or she would smack me around the head or something like that pairing the original behavior with a response that isn't desired. Then you only get to secondary school. You know, I would do a lot of undesirable things in secondary school and I would automatically be given detention, right? 212 detentions in five years of secondary school. What a record. What a legend. Um, eight weeks a fucking year in detention. Unbelievable. Anyway... That didn't quite work, unfortunately, for the school or for people I had to be in school with or teachers or school counsellors. But 
the desired thing is, you know, you pair something with a negative response and you are less likely to do that in the future, right? Now, what Jaron Lanier says is, this isn't necessarily the negative aspect of social media that he's talking about here, more like, you know, how, why we get addicted to it. We have become like Pavlov's dogs, effectively. Social media prompts you to do things by triggering responses that you are entirely unaware of. Now, largely what he's referring to here is the dopamine hypothesis that I put forward in lecture three or four, four, I think. The idea that um, social media taps into the neural limbic system in a particular way and prompts us to have small bouts of dopamine release, which we find very, very nice, basically. And we find lovely and we, 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 you know, we want more of that, so we keep doing it. In effect, we have become Pavlov's dogs because we associate the process of clicking on the app, going onto the page, scrolling, finding something we like, and then going on to the next thing, and that shallow sort of reward mechanism that we're given, we have come to sort of trust that. We have come to think, yeah, that's nice. We don't even think about it anymore. Our behavior with regards to social media is completely unthinking. Because the key thing about classical conditioning, as Pavlov discovered it, and others afterwards, is it's not conscious. Those dogs weren't thinking about the bell, they were just acting on animal instinct. You get told off enough about drinking bleach as a kid, you, th you start to forget about the idea of drinking bleach. And believe me, as a homeowner now, I have several bottles of bleach, and it does not occur to me to drink them. You know, I, I am, I'm fixed, effectively, because I've been classically conditioned not to drink bleach. Good job, mum. I was cracking life lessons imparted then. Some, some of the other life lessons not so good, but that one worked. This is the Lanier quote on this. Who would trust a hypnotist who is working for an unknown third party? Apparently billions of us do. We're all signing up to something where we're being hypnotized into doing things on the behalf of somebody else entirely that we don't even know. We have no idea who's paying for these, these things. We have no idea who's after us. And we're all signing up for it and we're all happy. Good job, everyone. So the first reason you should delete social media is to restore your free will to get away from companies who would manipulate you in order to sell you things and to make your own decisions and to exercise being a human being. Because if we don't have free will, then maybe we're not really human at that point. Should we have a break for five minutes? Lovely. It gets worse, by the way, all of this. It gets darker than this. <laughs>